Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's AOP Live. I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, before we get started, I just want to introduce, as always, my partner here at Art of Procurement, Kelly Barner. Hey, Kelly. Hi, Phil, and hi, everybody. I'm glad that you've all joined us for today's live event. Yeah, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. If you're not uh, familiar with this tool that we're using, we recently switched over to a new tool for events. And so uh, one of the reasons we did that is because there's a really great chat functionality. So if you do have things uh, that you want to chime in, um, questions that you have to ask, there's also a Q&A section within the tool in the sidebar, but you can pop anything in the chat, anything in the Q&A. We'll keep an eye on that as we're going through the conversation so we can bring over anything and uh, pose any questions that we have to our speakers um, you know, as they come in. So um, keep a look on that, and hopefully we're able to, to make this as interactive as we possibly can. Now, uh, I'm going to do a quick introduction to today's topic. Today's topic is strengthening your corporate culture to survive challenging economic times. So many companies relax their spend management activities, but then as the economy changes, uh, it's brought us to reassert a greater level of control. Today, we're going to be talking about how procurement can help our organization, obviously, in these challenging economic times and when we think about spend management, but with also out going too far. There's always this fine line between what's enough, what's too much, and what actually pushes the business away from us. We're going to be joined by two guests. We're going to be joined by Mew Wag, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Procure Analytics, and Matt Reddington, who's the Vice President of Operations at Procure Analytics as well. So... Without further ado, let's bring Matt and Mew onto the stage for our conversation. All right, we're just getting your cameras all sorted there. And uh, here we go. I see you, Matt. Uh, Mew, you just need to um, take your camera and your, uh, your microphone off mute. There we go. Perfect. There we go. Well, first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, Our thank pleasure. Thank you for having us. Now, the first question that um, I always ask in these kind of webinars and also in the podcast that we do is, did you find procurement or did procurement find you? So I'm going to ask that to you first. How did you find yourself in procurement? So I would say uh, procurement found me. Um, I previously worked at a nonprofit cancer organization and uh, I performed analytics to um, expand or reduce programs across the country for that organization. And uh, when I was introduced to the owners of this uh, uh, company, Procurement Advisors back in the day and now Procure Analytics, uh, it was a neat uh, offering where we could use analytics to drive efficiencies in organizations. So I thought it was a nice way to marry sort of visibility to data and insights that you can use to um, drive optimization. Uh, thanks. Matt, how about you? How did you find yourself in procurement? Uh, I'd say I'm one of the rare breeds that uh, I found procurement. I actually okay. uh, grew up with it in the family. My father was uh, 30 years of Procter & Gamble procurement. Uh, back in high school, he used to tell me he was negotiating the contracts for the L'Oreal models. I thought he was sitting down talking to the models, mm -hmm. not in a room with lawyers going back and forth. Uh, no wonder you went into procurement. Yeah, you did, right? so, uh, I actually have a degree from Miami University in purchase and procurement. It was the last graduating class before they changed that to supply chain management. And over the last 20 years, I've had different roles on the direct side, the indirect side, uh, in operations all across the procurement, both for CPG companies and manufacturing organizations. Okay. There's definitely a, a rare breed then of actually and having a purchasing and procurement degree as well. I don't think there's many folks out there in the wild that have that. It's been fun. Now, um, you know, as I think about today's topic, the first thing I wanted to just ask from your perspective, because in your roles at Procure Analytics, you get to work with a lot of different clients. You see a lot of different procurement teams where kind of the focus on site on savings comes and goes you know it's often cyclical from an organization just depending on the economic cycle but i wonder if you're noticing anything unique at this time and matt i'll pose that to you first so um and we were talking about this a little in, in the pre pre-conversation but we're, we're definitely in a cycle right so there's a pendulum that swings and it tends to swing one way or the other coming out of uh, COVID or the heart of COVID, i should say a lot of organizations really swung to decentralized decision making. I just need to get something in here. I really don't care what that supplier looks like. Yep. We, we've seen that pendulum start to swing back the other direction, especially with uh, the CFO role saying, hey, I've got too many accounts in the general ledger. I need to get that under control with the CPO actually having a seat at the C-suite table now. 
which is really something we've started to see over the past 10 years, but I say it's even more important coming out of COVID. So we, we've really started to see that, um, I'll say central lead taking more of a, a, a strong hold now versus the very much decentralized we saw over the period of COVID. But um, you, you got anything in? Uh, yeah, I would say that uh, in terms of uh, focus in uh, removing, you know, costs out of your business, essentially what it's driving is, um, you know, reducing your budgets or cutting your costs in terms of uh, procurement and mostly in fragmented areas. So you will see that, you know, maintenance repair operations, indirect in general is very fragmented. There's a big portion of unplanned or non-repetitive uh, purchases associated with it. So the natural um, uh, need is to go find savings or reduce the set of suppliers, if you will, or try to find cons uh, consolidation standardization activities. So I would say that it is, uh, you know the easiest response i say uh you know to cut costs but mm -hmm. uh it's it's how you approach it and the sustainability of it and and to matt's point on um you know COVID days uh, supply chain um, reliability was obviously the primary focus and as that's starting to get better and show improvements and there is this disinflation if you will you know it's not necessarily deflation but uh, a reduction you know of the rate of inflation that everybody mm -hmm. is looking to get that um, the next level of savings and take advantage of that downward market you know, something you said then about uh, sustainable savings, I think is really important because it's really easy to go after savings that ultimately are not going to stick. And then in 12 months time or six months time, you're back at square one, or you may actually be paying more money um, because you went for the short term opportunity, or you did things that perhaps didn't bring the rest of the business along for the ride. Um, and so you couldn't actually drive compliance, which I know we're gonna talk about a lot more in a minute. Um, but we see that so often. You go for the short term hit of a good saving, but you look back 12 months time and you didn't really accrue the benefits that you thought you would do. That's correct. Now we have a, a survey that we pulled just before. Let's see if we can pull this up on screen, Kelly. Um, because we asked um, members of the after procurement community, which of the following best describes your company's priority for procurement given the tightening economy. I'm just gonna read out the answers uh, just so that if anyone's listening to this later and not watching it on the webinar. So when we asked that question, in order of responses, we had 42% um, re of respondents said that budget reductions and clawbacks, uh, your company's priority for procurement given the tightening economy. The second, 34% uh, of responses was primary sourcing factories being cost savings. Uh, no change in priorities was 16% and then actually increasing uh, approvals around spending was the last of the four choices that we gave at eight percent. Um, now, as we look at those um, answers, Matt, I'm going to ask you first: Are you surprised by these results, or are these kind of in line with what you see on a day-to-day -day basis? I'd say the the sixteen percent was a little shocking on the no change whatsoever. I would have thought mm -hmm. that would have been much smaller. But as far as uh, primary focus being on cost of over a third. That's to be expected. There's still a lot of what I would say were classically trained procurement folks in the industry where their role is to uh, get the best total cost on a piece price from a supplier and not look at that total cost across the spectrum of what the value proposition is. Mm -hmm. uh, the budget reductions are interesting in, in my mind. That, that can go a couple of different ways where whether that's a, a true budget reduction or procurement getting a seat at the table to help with controlling those budget expenses. So really interested to see how this conversation goes more around that and and Mew, any thoughts that you have on seeing those results now it's just similar to what matt just said that the no change is definitely surprising because you are everybody wants to take advantage of you know the change uh in the conditions uh and and the economy um so i would say that uh, that was a little surprising but as far as budget reductions i think you know given the the challenges the continued challenges with labor uh with certain input costs you know still being very very high uh, this is natural so i'm not surprised to see the higher budget uh, reduction and the cost containment, if you will. But I think, uh, um, you know, how you get there and, you know, who you involve in the process is, uh, you know, is very key to drive those. Um, and Kelly, anything from your side that jumped out as you looked at those? Well, obviously, the 42% jumps out, right? But I think the thing that I think about, and Phil, you and Matt have both commented on this, it is, in fact, cyclical. 
So as much as right now, things are tightening, people are concerned, we're looking at the bottom line. We do also know that at some point as we go into the future, all of that's going to open back up and there's going to be a more liberal mindset around spending. There's going to be more freedom. And we just have to make sure that the way we handle the transitions maybe between the points on that cycle continues to set us up for success no matter what the top priority is. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, you said earlier about you know the role that procurement is having an increasingly visible role. Um, and you know, having conversations at the um, at the C-suite table, if you will, and being brought into those conversations more. Um, you know, as we have those conversations, are you seeing that the the impetus of that is cost related, or you know, is a CFO who's looking at procurement are they looking at procurement of driving more of a balanced scorecard of kind of value, or is it just savings? And savings is like the one the one focus and the only focus. So I feel like that's the second time today I've heard the balanced scorecard come back up. I hadn't heard that in a while. Um, it's, it's coming back in into a regular topic of discussion within the procurement or uh, sourcing world, right? So as I think of it, if you go back maybe five or six years ago, um, and I used to have this drawing on the side of my desk for folks, and it would say, I'm from corporate, I'm here to help every time we go out to the field. And, and it was kind of the thought that they had around procurement, right? So, oh, you're only here, you only care about cost. What I think folks have seen coming through COVID and, and coming out of that is that the procurement organization can really set up some strategic partnerships that drive a much broader total cost of ownership for yeah. the organization outside of piece price. To your earlier comment, Phil, you may take a you know an additional three or four percent savings from somebody today and 12 months from now, realize, ooh, that may not have been the best deal, versus looking at what that total value proposition is. As we look at a lot of the business we interact with personally. Um, many of them lack clear reporting to be able to measure how successful that pure price negotiation was. Mm -hmm. um, and do you think that that's critical to procurement sticking around, if you will, as the cycle changes and there's less focus on price, is our ability to look a bigger picture and take total cost of ownership as one of those things, but to make sure that we're doing that now as opposed to when all of a sudden the cycle has changed, then saying, you know what, there's some other things that we can do to help you as well. Oh, absolutely. Reporting is critical because if you can't measure it, then you can't drive value to it and you can't get people to drive change, right? So everything we've learned from COVID is everything drives around individuals making change and having that change be affected by those individuals as opposed to driving change affecting the individual. Mm -hmm. That's a very key difference there. Um, but the reporting, being able to track things, not just at a, a supplier level, how much did I spend this year versus last year, but taking it down to a SKU level, understanding specifications of what you're purchasing, both on the direct and the indirect side are, are very, very critical to procurement's long haul success. Uh, much as we saw the supply chain, uh, senior vice presidents and chief supply chain officers rise prior to COVID, to a seat at the table, keeping procurement there is really going to be driving that value so that the, the marketing organization, the operations team sees an ongoing value, not just a, a great, we'll bring in every three years to get a new price. Mm -hmm. um, now, Mew, we had 42% of responses, the top bucket in that poll was around budget reductions. Um, do you feel that is that a CFO going and challenging an organ challenging parts of the business to say we well, you need to cut your budget and therefore procurement is a tool to help drive that or, or can we be proactively helping organizations look at ways to reduce their budget by you know bringing opportunities to them so that we're actually playing a greater role than in the delivery of those like how do you see those is it kind of top down or is it bottom up from procurement and helping budget um, I, th I think I think it's both, uh, Phil. So I, I do see the initiatives, obviously, um, senior executive leadership is going to have line of sight to uh, the reasons why they should be um, reducing budget. And, you know, they, they, it's naturally going to trickle down to the teams that help drive that. So there, I think there's always going to be an element of, you know, uh, that that staying. But as far as taking a proactive approach, I think uh, I'd, I would say that they should heavily lean into their provider as well as their internal team and stakeholders. And that's where the consistency is, is taking cost out of business 
methodically and uh, thoughtfully is important and being able to do so with your internal teams backing it is very important. Uh, I see it very often that cyclical nature of, oh, I want to reduce my budgets. I want to take costs out. Let's just take it out to the market. There's always going to be someone out there at your door willing to give you a lower price on something. Mm -hmm. It's about how much can they sustain it? How long can they sustain it? And are they able to provide that excellent service associated with it, right? Is that here to stay? Is it trackable? There's also this um, notion of, I am seeing double digit savings, but is that savings on paper or are they immediate implementable and actionable savings? Because, and that ties into reporting, reporting before reporting after, is a lot of folks will hire, um, you know, third parties to drive these projects and cost savings projects, but they could be 20% savings and three months later, you're doing mm -hmm. this all over again and then engaging <laughs> your internal stakeholders and only to find out that you're looking at a limited basket, items that may not even matter to the organization or a, a specific location and you've got to reset and redo. So that's, that's the reason why you want to involve different stakeholders also in that decision. And yes. so can I tag onto that? Real yeah, quick? please, Matt. So a, a real live example that's playing out across the category in the indirect space is around pallets right now, right? They were in really high demand during COVID because all the retailers were hoarding them in their warehouses, they were stocking up. But there's been this de-stocking, right? So as we talk about like flash pricing or a really good offer, most folks would think the offer is too good to be true. You see that occurring now with the smaller hyper-regional players mm -hmm. because they have so many pallets sitting in their yard they're willing to sell those at cost because they have to keep their supply coming in. Otherwise, if they turn that off, they'll never get it turned back on. Yeah. So as you're thinking of categories where somebody is offering you a deal that's too good to be true, this is one that should be relatable for everybody because we all see them stacked around or the guy driving down the street with the truck of them. Um, that pallet deal, what you're really doing is you're, you're eroding a, a partnership that you could build with a more strategic relationship that, yeah, maybe it's a quarter cheaper to go take this flash sale on two trucks, but two mm -hmm. weeks from now, that price isn't going to be there anymore. Yeah. And you want that steady supply of quality product that delivers your product or your good to your customer, right? So ultimately, you don't make any money until you ship something. So saving that quarter there doesn't work if you can't get the pallet in two weeks. So how if there's an, an example like that, then where uh, an executive is pushing to go with the lowest cost, like how do you push back? Or um, you know, how, what are some ways that you can push back as a procurement professional to say, actually, it makes more sense to pay more money now because you have got to kind of look at the 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 bigger picture. So some of the benefits, Phil, right now is we are starting to see some deflation across these markets. Yeah. So ultimately, when they compare, uh, you know, versus last year's price or last price paid or even prior quarter, you're getting a benefit regardless in many categories. As we go here, we start seeing that de deflation occurring, minor deflation. I shouldn't mm -hmm. mention, but you're starting to see it. The the other pieces to talk about are what does it look like over a 12 month period of time? How does this look to standardize your financial ledger? Can you get to a supplier that can cover you across the country or across a large region of the country versus an individual location? Are you picking up better payment terms? Uh, we stick with the pallet example. A lot of the pallet business is very much a cash-based business, you know, net seven days, almost like transportation. If you can get to a more a uh, holistic supplier, you're getting onto that normal cycle, you know, net 45, net 60, maybe even a discount term. So when you start looking at that a, a quarter at a local facility on a single pallet, that price, when you start thinking about it from a, a holistic perspective, and if you work with your finance team on how you uh, capture and value those savings, I, I bet you have many more CFOs now saying, I'll take the extra 53 days of payments yeah. versus the quarter on a pallet right now with the way interest rates are yeah. Kelly, did you have some, do you want to jump in or? Well, the interesting thing here, and, and we're going to, I think, keep coming back to this during the conversation is that just like companies are in this cycle around spending and savings and procurement is on a cycle around what are, what behaviors are we trying to drive? What sorts of information are we sharing? We may find ourselves in cases, Matt, like with your pallet example, where we're actually saying these savings may not be worth it right now. And for procurement to be stepping up and saying that, we're probably going to deal with a lot of really surprised faces um, in, in Zoom meetings and things. But the truth of it is, if we are always 
let's just say tethering our priorities to what is truly needed and understanding that total cost picture, that total relationship picture, sometimes it means we're not going to be taking what seems like easy savings if the longer term impact to the business of that is not as great as it seems to be. Now, um, I want to just um, remind anybody, if you do have any questions, you'd like to pose any questions to me or to Matt, please do pop them either in the Q&A section on the uh, event technology or in the chat. We are keeping an eye on the chat. And I do want to talk a little bit about data because, uh, Mew, you talked about data um, just a few moments ago. And as we're starting to kind of do, um, starting to look at reporting and understanding what information we need to know about what we're spending so then we can start thinking about where the opportunities are to drive savings and drive kind of those responsible savings what kind of data points are you looking for um so just some basics uh, i would say uh, are key one is i would say the basic thing is consistency across all of your locations right that mm -hmm. uh, tool, the investment of technology um, in a great tool that can drive consistency and visibility across the organization is important. I think that's the first, um, that's the starting point. And from there, then you can look at some basic things to drive, such as, uh, you know, your pricing, your PO dates, your on-hand inventory values, your critical items, because you can go into this spiral of tracking savings or looking at last price paid and current pricing on items you have not purchased in the last three mm -hmm. years. And you have to draw that distinction on what truly matters uh, and what is repetitive, what is critical to the, the plant operations or to your locations um, in at, at large, right? What can you pull from each other? I think that um, dependency or creating that sort of a shared pool of resources and inventory within locations, so visibility all of that is also very important because there there's another way to drive cost is internal optimization you know one way is to obviously reduce your pricing but the other way to do is is get smart about how you're optimizing your own inventory and your own um, you know spend if you will and and rely on each other to not duplicate efforts on some of these things so I would say that a great reporting tool whether it's a p2p or p whatever you're using and consistency across the organization is is the best investment that any organization can make. One of the things I think about data is kind of the trust of the of the information that is within the tool. And I know it's something that certainly as a practitioner, I always struggled with is you spend a lot of time trying to gather the data together. And then, you know, first contact with a stakeholder, the stakeholder will find one little thing that isn't right. And it kind of blows out your whole uh, hypothesis right. and the data yeah. that you've uh, put together. And I just wonder if you've got any tips on, you know, how to think about, um, you know, having the greatest degree of confidence or trust in the data that you have, or even how to position that it may not be with 100% accuracy, but it's uh, at least actionable versus having nothing. Yeah, I would say having, you know, an, a, a consistent focus group as well to to help with that messaging, right? Because, you know, it can only, if it only comes from procurement, it's really one-sided. I think it's yeah. important to have operations, maintenance, manufacturing, uh, marketing, everybody in sales, you know, for that matter, everybody who is uh, directly related to it, be engaged and show that the pattern is uh, inconsistencies. You know, I spoke about MRO before. Uh, mm -hmm. It is, it, the category itself lends to disparate information. You're not going to have a clean parts information. It takes years to build, yeah. build something like that. And it's always forward looking if you look at, you know, your last six years, 10 years of data, you're going to find Joe Smith in the part description and that's what you have to live with. You don't know <laughs> what that is. And and mm -hmm. those are the kind of things that you have to work towards is, it's what are you, what categories are you dealing with? And then the, the you know, driving it towards the consistency and better formatting, not so much relying on what was history. When, when you have a high volume um, you know, a category that's got high volume of SKUs, and MRO could be one of those. You're, are you looking at doing something that's more like a market basket? So you're taking a kind of the Pareto approach to figuring out what's the high volume, what's the high spend, and using that as the basis of reporting as opposed to trying to spend, you can spend too much time to get 100% accuracy on everything that you buy, but actually there's not necessarily a great deal of value in doing that. Yeah, um, you know, just as Matt said, in terms of the, uh, you know, looking at 
pricing, not too far out, but more in the you know last three months, if you will. I think that is key. As far as a market basket approach, MRO specifically, you would say about 25 to 30 percent is repetitive purchases year over year. You're mm-hmm. talking about your facilities, maintenance, your people, safety, a little bit of hand tools, power tools, and everything else is mostly spot buys or ad hoc purchases. And so your market basket should involve a very small sprinkling. It is the Pareto principle. It should include 20% of your ad hoc spend. 80% of it should be a repetitive purchases. And you want not all of your high users, you know, in terms of like your high movers to be part of it, because a lot of providers out there will show you the best pricing on the top movers and they make up margin on the rest of it. So you want to have a really good sprinkling of the true representation yeah. of what your spend cube looks like. So that's what I would recommend in terms of building the market basket. And again, in terms of you know ha- measuring that towards pricing, a lot of majority of our folks are going to get hung up on that last price paid. In today's market, the definition of the timing for last price paid cannot be last 12 months, cannot be last 18 months or two years. It should be last three months at best. And you should be saying, what am I going to pay for this item today? And what am I paying for today the way it stands as well as with the new provider, what am I going to pay? And so we recommend bringing last price paid to net present value in every single situation because mm-hmm. that's the true measure of savings. You can't measure history against current. You have to measure current against current. It's challenging. You will see in the world we live in, most people will not count repeat savings as savings at all. Even things like rebates are not being counted if, you know, if you get a hundred thousand dollars in rebates last year and if you don't get a hundred and twenty then you're not taking that yeah. as an income hundred so doesn't count again the next year. exactly which is yeah. if you take that away you're not going to see yeah. any savings anyways um i promise matt i'm going to come to you in a moment but i just want to okay. ask one last question of you based on this line of thought because um you know one of my thoughts when you go and look and uh, when you're setting a baseline for savings that's only three months in the past rather than 12 months in the past for example i'm sure there's a lot of pushback from both stakeholders and the cfo to essentially say well you try to game the system by uh, you know of your um of the uh, of, of of demonstrating your performance by using as high of a baseline as you possibly can to demonstrate your savings against um, so I just wonder any kind of ways that you, that we can have that conversation with a CFO or with an FPNA analyst or whoever is really our representative in finance yeah. to make the case why that's a fair baseline. Yeah, we uh, we look at CPI PPI movements, mm-hmm. and that's the best gauge to see what the trend is. And if you're looking at the trend going up or down or a little bit of both, you and as long as your pattern is matching that, you are taking advantage of the upward downward movement in the market. And I think those impo- those indices are very important to measure against. When it comes to you know uh, parts that are associated with metals, you are looking at metal indices. Uh, you when it comes to packaging, you're looking at you know your other indices that are related to the packaging. Mm-hmm. There are different things that you have to measure against and look at and general inflation index, right? You are looking at the movements up and down and being able to just see what the world is doing. So expecting and that's why I mentioned disinflation. Everybody wants that pre COVID pricing, which does not exist. You are seeing a lower rate of inflation. You're just not seeing it as high as it used to be six months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so can I going to come to you in a few moments just to talk about the culture of change, but I have a couple of questions for Matt as well that um, that I wanted to ask. And we talk about opportunities for savings, and I wonder if there's any categories of spend that actually lend themselves to, uh, you know, quick turnaround, quick opportunities in savings. Where if we were doing a bit of an opportunity assessment and a wave plan and looking at areas to focus, that there are areas right now that you would encourage teams to focus on for some. You know, shorter win. I I hate to use the term quick win, but it's really you know get some savings in the bank so you can demonstrate the capability that you have. So then go and look at some you know longer term uh, opportunities. There's definitely some indirect categories that lend themselves to a, a faster time to close to get those savings in house or, or added value. Uh, most folks on the direct material side have a very regimented process of going through. If you're a resin buyer, you go through, you're very good at buying resin, you do that at times. If you're a steel buyer, things along those lines. The indirect categories um, tend to be a little bit more fragmented. 
you may have a, a category manager managing five, six, eight different categories where they're more of a generalist across there. Um, so a lot of categories across packaging or MRO could give you a, a, a quick uh, benefit there. But yeah. one of the big challenges that we have to overcome as an industry is a lot of the decentralized buyers are an aging workforce and a lot of Gen Z does not want to go into those roles. And so these experts that you had sitting in a chair inside of a manufacturing facility or a distribution center, in a few years, they won't exist in those worlds anymore. And so how do you build a sustainable data collection and implementation plan as an indirect procurement leader and get that influence? And it's really around building relationships across those divisions, right? Um, from, a, from a sales perspective, folks are talking like three wide, three deep. In procurement, we should apply that same thing up. I need to have three connections into each of the businesses that I'm supporting and driving value for. And I need to be three deep there so that if somebody moves, as we all tend to move in procurement roles, I know who else to go to. I'm not starting from ground zero to build that relationship. But really, it's around a sustainable pipeline of projects. Um, when I was running procurement teams in the direct and indirect side, we would have category managers that would want to cycle out of their roles about every two and a half or three years. Mm -hmm because they thought it would be a problem to go source that category again. They weren't looking at how they created value over that life cycle. Yeah. Like, I'm going to get my contract and go to my next category. All right, I'm out. I'm going to go to my next role. Do it again. So getting that longevity in there. I, I think the industry has also come a long way in um, educating and training folks new to the industry, either through ISM or Council Supply yeah. Chain Management. The, the amount of training, education, real world experience for these folks has been phenomenal. And there's been a bunch of folks that procurement has found them and yeah. they flooded into the industry. Uh, we just need more of that and we need more different views and ideas. We need folks from marketing to come in. We need operations folks in procurement. That different view or that lens on how to view not only savings, but the supply chain and the value chain that they're creating would be critical. Yeah, there's so many things there that I could probably take up the rest of this conversation around. It's fascinating to think about the generational differences of roles yeah. and, you know, folks who've been in roles for a long, long time and are truly the experts in their field versus generalists who, and I was a generalist, you know, who was really trying to get together as many different, working on a diff as many different categories as possible. Um, for me as well, when you're a generalist in a role where you're moving every two, two and a half years, because I did exactly the same, you know, a couple of years in a category and I wanted to move on to a new category. But then your thinking is very short term. Your thinking is about yeah. how can I extract the best, the, the most out of this category in the two years that shows, you know, exponential improvement from what my predecessor did so that I can position myself from a career perspective but without really any thoughts about what's going to happen in year three, because I'll be on to my next category by then. Um, and I think that, you know, from a, a leadership perspective, there's a challenge there in, in fostering that culture of, you know, you want to grow, but also long-term thinking. Oh, absolutely. I think you're, you're seeing even more with the uh, late Gen X, millennials, Gen Z, as their careers are very different than early Gen Xers or even boomers where they stayed in one organization and they, and they moved as their organization asked them to move. You've now got a generation or two generations of individuals that in some ways, and thinking about things, you're not sure why some people move jobs. Um, or they, they wanna go work in a different part of the country, right? They spend their whole life growing up in one city and they decide, mm -hmm. you know what? I wanna go live in Seattle. And I'm gonna figure it out when I get there. And it very much is a flashback in my mind to not when I was alive experiencing, but things that I've heard around, you know, late 60s, early 70s, that people just wanted to go do their own thing. So it, it's interesting. Um, I think the universities have done a good job of starting to train folks coming in. And I, I think there are a lot of great training programs on how to be in procurement and sourcing organization. But really getting that data pulled together is key as you got that aging workforce to be able to implement and execute against something. But procurement needs to be a friend. They need to have relationships. Without relationships, a price on a piece of paper is meaningless. And to use earlier comment, three months from now, you're going to be doing it all over again because you had no buy-in. And yeah. organizations are change fatigue. So you need to get those uh, champions early, right? You're going to pre-sell your idea to a couple of your champions before you actually sell your idea to the CFO. So that's a great segue, actually. Kelly, I'm going to hand over to you for our next kind of section of questions, yeah. which is around uh, the culture of change. 
You know, that is a perfect segue. And in fact, I was I was thinking as you were talking, Matt, about okay, so you're you're kind of describing a situation from a people or a talent perspective that a lot of us are working through. So let's think through how procurement can manage the executive level perspective, sort of on where we are right now around savings. Um, so Matt, if you're working for a procurement team whose company is in that 43% where budgets are being slashed and, and spend is being clawed back and the executive team calls procurement in and says, okay guys, it's ready to go into battle. We, we need you to get out there. We need you to get those savings. In that moment, what questions does procurement need to be prepared to ask to understand, okay, is there anything specific behind this that might change the way that we execute it? Or is there any messaging around this choice that we can use when we go out into the organization to work? Are there questions or, or pieces of information that you would want to bring into the conversation in that room at that point? Oh, absolutely. And the, the internal messaging is very different than how you take that out to the suppliers, right? So um, if you go out to suppliers and say, well, we just got a mandate from our CFO, you got to give us 10% or we're going someplace else. That generally is not going to work very well, um, especially in, in a market where folks are, are butting up against capacity. So you're coming out of COVID still and you've got a lot of that going on. Um, some of the things to really understand from that CFO or whoever the person that brings that the procurement organization in are around what's not only your short term goal impacting this year, but what are we looking at trying to do not this year, but next year and three years out? What's important to you? What, what would success look like? Would success look like more strategic suppliers that are coming in and providing ongoing value projects for us that may drive multiples on a piece price? Are we desperate for a savings today? Like, does it, do I need to talk to my incumbent to discount something today? And are we willing to sign up for a longer term agreement to understand what those parameters look like? In, in many cases, putting a supplier in place or making a, a supplier transition purely to save three, five, seven percent will backfire and end up costing the organization more because people won't be bought into the change. You could uh, be detrimental to operations efficiency, quality, throughput, whatever you want to call that, and lose focus on the total value that you're looking for. Yes, you may have a, a piece price variance that you can go wave your flyer around and tell the CFO you achieve, but the business on the other side um, is going to be detrimental by that. It's back to Phil's earlier comment around uh, the balanced scorecard, uh, bringing that back out and, and really understanding from a, a scorecard perspective, how do you impact not impact across others. Yeah. Now, Mew, maybe let me take what Matt shared and actually ask you about pushing it one step further. I appreciated your comments earlier about looking at NPV calculations, at understanding what's going on at a commodity pricing level or, or bringing in things like the, you know, PPI to these conversations. Um, is there something that procurement needs to um is there something that procurement needs to actually say to push back on the executive team? So Matt talked about asking questions to understand what's my timeline, what are some more specifics? Um, should procurement be prepared to entrench and maybe challenge the executive team a little bit under that situation? Uh, yeah, I think there are ways to do that. And it's not so much um, challenging, um, uh, you, you know, in a way that is offensive, but more with, I would say, data and insights. Again, understanding and explaining to them what categories are we looking at, the difference between direct and indirect, and how do you drive that, the impact to operations and maintenance and other, other um, uh, work streams of the organization. I think those things are very critical. Um, are we looking to drive savings by staying uh, in the same profile of the supplier network or are we willing to drive change to get that? You can certainly look at getting deeper savings if the um, 
if there is a change made at large, but that requires an investment of resources from your own organization and, uh, you know, influence is needed. So I, I would say the biggest challenge to pose, and we see this uh, to be, um, you know, an issue with, with some of the organizations we work with is there is a willingness from procurement to do it. There is the so-called mandate from the executive leadership, but there is no influence to drive the change. So it is very important to, from procurement, what they can do is to make sure that the executive leadership is willing to back that change to drive the savings. I think that would be the biggest challenge that they can pose to their leadership. Yeah. Now, you had made the comment earlier that certainly we can negotiate with suppliers. We can try to figure out different external paths for savings. But there are also things that can be done internally. We can look at demand. We can delay projects. We can review spec and maybe go on to something standard if it will work for some time. Uh, and yet, as Matt was making the point, it doesn't typically work to go out to suppliers and say, OK, everybody, find us 3 to 5%. A similar mandate around demand also doesn't tend to work all that well internally. So if we go out to distributed buyers or budget holders and say, okay, everybody, we got to work with you. We have to find this percent to not spend. That's also not going to go particularly well. Um, are there different ways, even when procurement is feeling a mandate, are there different ways we can communicate, message, approach some of these, maybe with some of the data and analytics that you've talked about, just so that we're, in essence, having the same effect, but we're going out to our points of contact within the business, and it sounds like a very different, more collaborative type of activity? Um, yeah, I could I could chime in really quick and would love Matt to jump in as well on sure. this is I think visibility to forecasts, building the right forecast to to be able to project demand is very important, uh, especially when it goes in your bill of materials, you can prepare suppliers better, you can look at holding pricing and pre buying better. I think there are different ways to do this again, it is can't can be done without internal collaboration, but sitting everybody sitting at the table and understanding what are the goals and objectives and what are the quick wins and what's the simplest way to get there and involving your suppliers to get there it's very very critical because they can provide you insights that you will probably don't have line of sight to whether they have seen it with companies they service in the like industries and they can bring context and even the you know, we, we do this all the time is where we refer our uh, members to each other to draw best practices. There are different ways that you can drive um, the efficiencies internally. Matt, what would you add to what Mew just said? Yeah, so uh, from, from a past life, it's a very real example here is in aftermarket automotive parts. Kelly, if you own a Ford truck, you're not gonna put a Chevy hood on your Ford, right? <laughs> so with the aftermarket parts or repair parts, what these guys have done, and I was a part of this from a packaging perspective, is they're actually sharing best practices on how to pack those parts and distribute them out to the dealerships. Because they realize that while the hood size of a Chevy and a Ford may be close enough, if they can all buy the same packaging, all of their costs go down. And so there's these little industry groups that are working together where they're not competing with each other. But the other thing I would say is to Mew's point around inventories and understanding what you're buying, there are many uh, new members that we've worked with over the past six months. When we've presented them a new program or an opportunity to enhance the value, not only from a price perspective, but ongoing VAVE savings, they then go look at their inventories and find that they have four or six months of inventory, but they've continued to buy at the same volume because the supplier previously was just selling them the same thing over and over again. And so that demand signal is really important to understand especially if you're, if you're making a move from a, a hyper-regional supplier to a more national supplier that has better coverage for you, where you may have been very concerned of this one site's gonna run out of product because they only have one distribution point to, well, now I have five that are within maybe 200, 300 miles of me that could service me with that same item. Understanding those pieces would be really critical from that perspective, Kelly. Now, if I stay with you, Matt, and, and this is, I think, one of the big concerns that a lot of procurement professionals and teams have, if we have all this work ahead of us focused around savings, can we be out in the business talking about savings, talking about savings, talking about savings without inadvertently sort of sending the procurement brand back to where it was in the past where people heard procurement and they thought savings. We've worked so hard to get ourselves back to value. Is there anything that we can do about the way we have those conversations to deliver the short-term objective, which is savings, without 
interfering with our brand bigger picture or longer term? Kelly, it is a great question. Um, and I, I'm smirking because I'm thinking back to a former SVP when I was at a previous company. Um, just, just saying, you know, you're, you're a great buyer. You just keep doing it. You're a great buyer. What he was really saying is you're, you're very good at controlling our cost. What he didn't want was us playing in his business, right? So there's this, this territory of, nope, this is my four walls. Don't get in there. Um, really what's worked in the past and what we've kind of encouraged many of our, our members to do is to partner with your peers in operation, partner with your peers in supply chain, go work on one of their pet projects that they can't get done, get that done for them. And this savings mentality that you're having to talk about goes away because now you're having a conversation with a person, not somebody who's trying to say, well, no, I don't want you to play with my little P&L. Yeah. So, Phil, I'm going to pull you in on this, too, in a yeah. second. But first, I want to ask Mew a similar question. You know, as we're going out and having these conversations, what do we need to be doing to make sure that we're, although maybe our efforts and energy are currently focused around one primary objective, that that's not seen as the only thing procurement can deliver? Um, I would say, you know, the word TCO reduction is very, very powerful. And, you know, when you're looking at the total cost, it involves engineering, manufacturing, maintenance, operations, all of the above. And you have to see the entire life cycle of uh, the yeah. product and what's on the on the floor to understand where you can drive efficiencies. And then consistency of those efficiencies is important. Once you're, once you're running on very efficient operations, the cost reduction automatically follows. And I think the focus needs to shift from piece price product savings as much as running your plants and operations efficiently and everything automatically follows predictive maintenance your preventative maintenance uh, your spending on repair is much easier than spending 10 to 30 folds on a replacement yeah. being able to invest in technologies that can help you drive that will automatically get you the value of the savings as opposed to just taking something out of the market and getting it on the surface only to wash out your operational efficiencies. Yeah. Now, Phil, here's where I want to get your point of view. We're regularly having conversations with executives, with teams, where we're genuinely trying to figure out, okay, what do you think your problem is? What is your mm -hmm. problem actually? And how can we potentially help you? Do you think there's an opportunity, even if procurement has to sit down and have these somewhat difficult conversations with budget holders, with internal buyers around, listen, we need to find ways to cut back somehow or other. That's sort of the downside of the conversation. Is there an upside opportunity that can be created either around sort of general relationship building or maybe asking the right questions to probe a little bit deeper and start to build something of a pipeline of opportunity for procurement to follow back up either about additional savings or around value oriented opportunities that we can't do right now, but we certainly could do in the near to medium term future. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that um, we sometimes don't think of our own, we're not self aware of what an organization thinks about us. And so that's one of the challenges we have because we're afraid. And, and you know, I did this as a practitioner as well. So um, I'm certainly guilty. You're kind of afraid of going and asking because you don't want to hear what the what the rest of the organization really perceives that your role to be as procurement. And instead, you just complain about the fact that, well, they never work with me or I'm always, you know, being brought in late to opportunities or, you know, uh, everyone just is trying to go around me, um, but without really understanding a root cause analysis of why that is. So there's definitely a lot of um, benefits in going and talking to the organization, whether it's you that does it or a third party, sometimes it's easier for a third party to go and have these conversations mm -hmm. with your stakeholders to truly understand what what does what is the perception? You know, are stakeholders trying to find a way and are they trying to protect their suppliers from procurement? Or do they see you as being a tr true driver of um, you know value to them as a stakeholder? And where are you on that map? And then for well, what do you need to do to close the map to close that gap, sorry. Um, on the uh, positive side, it may be better than you think, so that might give you more confidence to go and have some of these conversations and be a little bit more challenging. Whereas before you just kind of yeah. said yes to everything because you want to keep folks happy. <laughs> and we do want to keep people happy. Uh, but obviously just like it's it's not our money and we don't get to keep the savings, and, right? We're, we're trying to keep the company operationally healthy. 
Yeah. yeah, it's such a fine line between uh, because we talk about it all the time. We talk about the yeah. the customer experience, you know, the customer experience of a stakeholder, and there's that line between doing yes, sorry, saying yes to everything, so that you know you get a great NPS score because they think you're wonderful, versus actually uh, respectfully pushing back and challenging because that's truly our role is to help guide our organization to, to get more value out of their purchases, the third party spend that they have. Um, and that's something sometimes difficult to do because we feel that it's going to upset people and push them away from us rather than bring them closer to us. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Um, so Matt and Mew, one last topic I want to hit with you. And, and this is maybe one last reminder to everybody in the audience. If you have last minute comments and questions you want to sneak in, now is a great time. Um, but I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about accountability. So procurement is having these conversations internally about what needs to be done, what can be changed, what's it ultimately going to mean. How do we make sure, Mew, that they don't end up just being conversations? How do we hold ourselves accountable to our part of the responsibility? How can procurement go out and hold buyers and, and budget owners accountable? How do we do that again without disrupting the type of relationship we ultimately want to have with the business? Yeah, Kelly, of course, it's very important, uh, you know, to make sure that the effort that's put in to drive those projects are a yield fruition. And, um, you know, accountability can only be driven if there is buy-in, right? So first, going back to Matt's point on making sure before kicking off the project that there you have an internal um, set of stakeholders to help you drive the change. They are, then they will be more bought into being held accountable to driving it as well. So that is first and foremost, I would say the most important thing. Um, different ways of tracking uh, progress is very important. You know, we have transition trackers, compliance trackers. For that, you need to baseline current state. So when you are about to start on this journey, you want to make sure that when I talked about paper savings versus the actual realized savings, it's because you are going to be able to draw that baseline and then measure on a monthly, quarterly basis, what is the progress? You traffic light it for perhaps and see which are the, um, you know, uh, projects that are going uh, on, which are on track, which are lagging behind. That helps you get to the root cause of the ones that are in the yellows and the reds. You can do that by location. You can do that by project. There are different ways to drive. And then that kind of gets you down to the person who is the, uh, you know, person of the group of people who are supposed to be driving uh, the change, right? So as long as you're able to narrow down to the root cause, you can hold accountability. But first and foremost, I would say that having the buy-in is important. Having internal advocates is important. So pilots work great. It's important, you know, that you are able to show that it's worked successfully. Taking it in bits and pieces is also great. If you're, you're not, you shouldn't be trying to boil the ocean if it is a massive project to drive the, um, the project savings, if you will. It's important to probably create one, you know, take one or two uh, key stakeholders who have a nice influence within the organization and that is received so much better that, you know, so, so when uh, one person has done this well, they They've, they've actually put their brand name behind it and we have you know it trialed and tested and i think it works really well and a lot more people will be willing to jump on that wagon and be able to drive that change but i would say suppliers too have this uh, amazing set of reporting that they can provide and it's they, they are in it to win it everybody can hold them accountable as well to make sure that they're you know that that the projects that they are held accountable to are being delivered because they benefit from the growth uh, you know from for the for that spend if you will so i think you can hold all parties accountable as long as you are having uh, the buy-in from them and it's funny that you go there me with the suppliers because that's actually exactly what i was going to ask matt so if we think about whether it's, and in some cases, it ends up being contract changes, right? And that's a different set of accountability. But if we think of anything collaborative or creative that we're trying to do with suppliers, is there a sense of follow through, a sense of accountability that procurement needs to invest in and create externally to support the work that we're also trying to do internally at the same time? Kelly, I'd say absolutely. So if I go back to my CPG days, um, we required our suppliers to do quarterly business reviews. 
well, the first one usually went pretty well, and the second one was okay. But by the third, <laughs> you lost leadership participation. Yeah. It ends up being the category manager and the main sales contact. There's no traction there anymore. You had these great, grandiose ideas, but there's no accountability. Um, one of the things that I'm a big fan of is uh, the four disciplines of execution or 4DX and, and making those micro commitments. And what we've found is with the suppliers that we partner our members with, they're willing to make those commitments and report out on those commitments. And if we can get the buy-in from procurement, from operations on the other side at the member level, those are long-term sustainable cost out opportunities for folks that are going to far exceed a piece price reduction. I love that idea of a micro commitment. Right. And it's it's sort of like we do. We talk about pilots all the time on the, the digital side of the house. But when you think about any of these relationships, getting somebody to take on something relatively small and contained, but have it be something that they feel accountable to, that they've bought into Mew, as, as you made the point as mm -hmm. well. Um, what what an interesting technique. I, I, I love that idea of of micro commitments. It feels very attainable. Um, so, Phil, maybe just to come back to you, I, I don't know if you have any concluding thoughts you want to share. We've heard so much from Matt and Mew today, um, but I'm also mindful of the time. And unfortunately, we're going to have to start to wrap. Yeah. So I was just wondering if I could sneak in one last question, uh, which actually um, goes back to earlier in the conversation, we we're talking about total cost of ownership and really looking at total cost of ownership as opposed to piece price. Uh, for example, as we're doing comparisons of what the opportunities are around cost savings. Uh, so Matt, I think I'm going to throw this question to you because maybe you can dig deep into that uh, procurement and purchasing degree uh, from back in the day to answer this one. <laughs> maybe in the textbook. But I'm thinking about how do you, what are some of the advice you can give around building a TCO model? Because I think that's where sometimes, you know, total cost of ownership is a great from a conceptual perspective. Like we understand but then it falls short because we don't actually know what should we take into account as part of that model and where should we get the information from? So mindful of we've only got a couple of minutes, you might not be able to give us the whole deep dive, but I'd love any tips that you can share around building a TCO model. Yeah, um, so it reminds me of the movie Tommy Boy and the brake pads that are going on in that movie, <laughs> that reference point, right? So um, th that's generally how procurement folks think, right? A piece price and, and the values on that brake pad wearing longer and stopping for the accident, Tommy Boy does all the fun stuff in the movie. But really when you're, when you're looking at the TCO, um, it, it moves towards a balanced scorecard of, of price is important and, and price should be relative, right? You, you shouldn't pay 20% more for something to get all these other factors. It, it should be in the uh, single digit realm of, of reality. From there, you've got to look at what are your stakeholders or really your business partners? What do they value? Yeah. Um, we loved pulling in in my past life what I would call a VOC or voice of the customer. Our customer was operations. Our customer was marketing. What do they care about? Well, marketing has a set budget we talked about probably, let's say it's a million dollars. They want to figure out how to spend more with that million dollars. How do you help them get there? then they're going to help you drive a project through. Maybe engineering's a hurdle for you. You've been trying to optimize a product, going from um, specialized gloves to the same form fit function of those gloves, but a generic brand name. And engineering's like, nope, it has to be this, has to be this, mm -hmm. has to be this, safety team, right? So finding out where those pieces are, that helps you build that TCO piece out. But it's outside of price. What are the suppliers committing to? What are, they, what are, your, what are your other partners in the business looking to achieve from a long-term perspective. And when you start to take that lens, the TCO savings really start to materialize for you and you start to see where you can get that value for. Mm -hmm. um, another example of TCO, and I'm gonna go back to my pallet example was, when PA launched our pallet program a little over a year ago, the most of the people that we engaged with were not being paid for scrap lumber on the backside. Right. That was a huge value for folks through yeah. the program. So there's always a different lens to look through something. Yeah. Somebody's trash could be somebody else's valued material as they go back into that. Well, I know it's time to wrap up, so I won't put you on the spot with any more follow-up questions um, <laughs> related to that, Matt. That's probably a whole different discussion as well, is TCO analysis. Um, but I want to thank uh, you. I want to thank Matt uh, for joining us today on this AOP Live. And Kelly, thank you as well for helping me and ask the questions. Oh, absolutely. And before anybody goes, if you're looking for upcoming events, check out the artofprocurement.com event calendar for upcoming opportunities to learn from experts just like Mew and Matt.
Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We look forward to speaking to you again soon and enjoy the rest of your day. Until then, take care.